Look, I'm just a geologist. I like rocks. I love rocks. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Geology Flannel Cast. My name is Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's that's Chris laughing in the background. I'm Chris. Hello, <laughs> the antics. Uh, yeah, now I was gonna I was gonna take us down a notch and and say hello. I'm Jesse, but I'm laughing too much as you can tell. <laughs> to, to fill you all in, we were, we were doing that uh, countdown from five, like in Wayne's World, where you don't say two or one, and uh, you know some of our Patreons were getting in on it too, and apparently Chris just can't be a professional pull together so no it's just like you know when you start laughing at church you know you got to hold it in it's just like oh i'm done you know <laughs> i'm done the moment you have to hold the laugh <laughs> in it's done you know we, uh, so chris and i were once at a conference with this, <laughs> we got to do this. and we literally had to leave the room because it was it was a small conference and it was an echoey auditorium <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I had met you guys for beers after that. That was in uh, West uh, Philly, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, hello. Welcome to the Geology Flannel Cast, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. If you're a first time listener, thanks for showing up. If you're a continuing listener, thanks for coming back. And uh, welcome to the premier geology podcast. Um, we've got an action-packed episode because every episode here at the Geology Flannel Cast is obviously action-packed. Uh, we've got some current events we're going to be covering today. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's, we should just jump right into it. First story. Who wants to go first? All right. Can I, I just want to, mine's tiny. Do it. All right. Uh, Rocks. And a I'm done. <laughs> it's a follow-up. It's right. not, it may not, it may not be tiny, it may be huge. The monolith out in Utah is gone. Wow. All right. Yes. So let's, let's refresh, refresh in case people haven't listened to past episodes. What is this monolith, Jesse? There's out in this very rural, very remote, remote. canyon yeah. out in the Utah desert. The, the uh, Bureau of Land Management people were doing a sheep survey and they stumbled upon just in the bottom of this canyon, like this 10 foot, was it 10 foot? It was like 10, 10, 10 or 12 feet tall. Tall metal obelisk. Yeah. Some sort of this metallic statue that, <clears throat> not sure who put it there or why it's there. It's been there for uh, a few years, it looks, according to using some Google Earth images. Yeah, they said probably almost four years it was there. Yeah. And it like lines up with a crack in the can. Have you seen that? Like it yes. sort of lines up with, but it is, it is gone now. I actually, I, I, I know what happened to it. I don't know if I want, if you want me to spoil it. Do it. Wow. Um, some, <laughs> some video surfaced, some, some, some guys uh, went out, some, a photographer went out to take some pictures of it, like pinpointed using Google Earth where it was at. And while, they were out there these three or four people showed up and uh just knocked it over and put it on a wheelbarrow and carried it away but it turns out they weren't responsible for it the one guy is sort of a well-known climber in the area and he posted it on his like instagram <laughs> they were saying as they knocked it down uh don't put your trash in in nature like leave no trace okay they, they were sort of upset that someone had put it there yeah because it, it is a it, it was a national monument at, at one point but then the national monument size was reduced uh, yeah. in the current administration so it was no longer technically a national monument i think but um oh it's just not in bears anyway, ears yeah it was a, yes near yeah. bears ears yeah. yes all right so that's that's up by moab then i believe yeah yeah yeah, so the one guy is like a a big climber out in that area, I guess, mm -hmm. who knocked it over. But wow. um, but another follow up. He's a guide. Thanks, thanks, Patreon David. He's not a yeah. He's like a a guide out in that area. But second follow up, a monolith similar to it 
appeared randomly in Romania. Oh, I thought it was Greece. Was it Romania? It was Romania. Okay. But I, I think that one is gone too. Ooh. So the, these monoliths are just popping up. Aliens, man. It's the only explanation. <laughs> uh, man. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on this monolith thing. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, this, this could be it. Well, can we tie well, this in? Should we tie this in with your short little story, Chris? Yeah, which one? Oh, the with the radio telescope? Yeah, Arecibo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me pull the story up real fast. Um, so the the huge radio telescope in Puerto Rico has completely fallen down and it's like it's done. Goodbye. Uh it was a nine hundred ton <laughs> radio telescope and um the whole thing collapsed. Uh, was it? It was either today or yesterday. So um, I think it was yeah. yesterday. Yesterday. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it had been. Uh, it wasn't looking too good. They had some cables, uh, s- some very important cables, kind of holding the whole thing up. It's kind of snapped, and it was. It's been compromised now for several months. I think since. Uh, okay, the main cable well, broke back in early November. So it's been been about a month now. That it's been heavily yeah, compromised. Yeah, and it was. It, it was initially sort of damaged during Hurricane Maria three years ago. And then there were some subsequent like minor earthquakes that stabilized it. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It, it's, it's been in rough shape for a little bit here. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, this thing is gigantic. It's been in a couple of movies. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, so I went to talk it, about it Goldeneye for a little bit. Uh, James Bond, Pierce Brosnan got into a big yeah. fight on that thing. Yeah. It slid, slid down it. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, they put it there they actually like use the natural contour of the land kind of to help them uh place it like it's so because of the cost topography there there you go yeah yeah so 1963 it went online and um yeah it was it announced it was like two weeks ago so whenever i don't know this it, it in like november 20th i think it was they announced they were decommissioning it because there was so much damage and the cost to upgrade it. And then, you know, just yesterday, December 1st, the, <clears throat> the main structure. So if you look at an old picture, the, the, the thing hanging on cables over at the big, like receiver circular. Yeah. Um, radar part of it. <laughs> uh, collapsed inwards the cables broke if you you can look at some pictures you can actually see like the cables fraying and the the one yeah. manager on site said for the past couple of days like you just go out there and you just hear cables snapping oh jeez oh, yeah wow. yeah so uh um, okay so the telescope was last used on august 6th and then um days later the first cable snapped then on November 6th, another cable broke. And then December 1st, boom, goodbye. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, if we were- I'm sorry, to- this is a oh. bit of a coincidence. This telescope starts to break the same time we find this monolith. That's what I, that's why I'm saying we should the oh, tie him uh, in here. Oh, I didn't understand yeah. the, uh, the segue there. I was, whoop, went over my head so a little it's, bit. <laughs> yeah. Aliens putting monoliths, and now they're getting rid of our ability to call for help <laughs> into deep space. I'll have to, I'll have to look into this um, one. <laughs> yeah, I think we might have just made that conspiracy theory up. Yeah, we're, we. But Ar- yeah. So Ar- <laughs> Ar- Arecibo is home to one of the earlier attempts to basically just beam a message into space. So they've they've done you know SETI has used Arecibo so the search for search for extra yeah, um, and they beamed what's called the Arecibo message now, and if you look at it, it's kind of this crazy colorful image. And it was set in binary, and it's <clears throat> you know it's got the numbers one to ten and sort of DNA, the elements of DNA and <clears throat> that double helix and and some nucleotides and where the planets are and so on. And it was designed by Frank Drake, 
Ah, of the, the Drake, Drake equation. equation. Oh, yeah. So he um, he wrote the message with some help from Carl Sagan. Of course. So they, yeah. So they, they beamed it um, at the globular cluster M13, which is 25,000 light years from Earth. Hmm. It's um, a hop, skip, and jump away. Hop, skip. I don't know why they shot it there, but we'll just pretend they knew what they were doing. Sure. That's, that's the way I like to think about. It. Yeah. So in 50 million years, somebody will come looking for us and yeah. we'll uh, all be dead. What, um, Arecibo Goldeneye, <clears throat> most famous. It was also in the movie Contact, which was written by Carl Sagan. Hmm. I had no, so, no idea Carl Sagan wrote Contact. Oh, yeah. 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 He, he wrote them all. He wrote every book. <laughs> Ever. So if we want to get, uh, if we want to install a new telescope there, it's going to cost like $350 million. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real bummer. I was sad when that happened. I, that, you know, it, it, it is extremely frustrating to know that there's such a gigantic piece of equipment out there that's been so useful for so many decades that it just was just not maintained is what well, it sounds like. Um, uh, there's been like some people say there might've been some things they could have done. Other people say like there really wasn't anything they could have done. It was 50, 57 years old. Is that what? 50, that sounds about right. Yeah. If it was since about 57 years yeah, yeah. operation. So. And it, so. Yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> it's, it's a, it's a tough environment for, you know, you're in basically the tropics rainforest like conditions. Yeah. So, the corrosion, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. All right, I take it all back. They're, they're all off the hook. Okay. Cool. Right. I was <laughs> I was just thinking a couple couple of cans of Rustoleum, you know, save the day. <laughs> it's like the it's like the Ben Franklin Bridge in Philly. Yeah. They just gotta keep painting it. Exactly. You they go. get to one end and they start over again. Yeah, that bridge is what eighty years old now. It's an old bridge. Nineteen. Yeah, 19- it is it's older than the Golden Gate. Fun fact. It wasn't it the biggest. Wasn't it the biggest uh, suspension bridge at the time? It was, it was at the time. Yeah. At the time. Okay. Uh, started construction in 1922, and it it opened in 1926. Uh, Holy cow! It only took four years back in the 20s to build that thing. That's and incredible. From- 1926 to 1929, it was the longest single span suspension bridge. Wow, this is a good three years. Like, uh, it's like the Chrysler building it was the tallest building in the world for like seven months until they finished the Empire, Empire State, State building. building. Yeah, uh, and the Empire State building went up crazy fast too. It was like a floor a day or a floor a week or something. Yeah, like you couldn't yeah. do it at that rate today. No, nope. Nobody, nope, nope, nope. All right. What, uh, you want to get into some uh, more news? Or actually, let's pay the bills. Wolf. Let's take a moment right now and, uh, and pay the bills. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to thank the Formatting Formula for being our sponsor. Please check out formattingformula.com or YouTube forward slash C forward slash formatting formula for all of your Word document formatting needs. Um, I actually got a text from the formatting formula this week saying that one of our listeners uh, posted a comment on one of the YouTube videos saying this really helped them out and that, you know, they were able to figure out what they needed to figure out in word based on watching a YouTube video. So uh, if any of you out there are listening and are using their YouTube videos, please, you know, drop a comment, just write, Hey, geology flannel cast sent me your way. And, uh, you'll receive a 10% discount on that YouTube video, which is free. <laughs> so <laughs> took me a second there. I was like, what? <laughs> so 10% of zero. So uh, no, but you know, it, it's always, you know, it's always fun to get those little messages knowing that uh, people are out there listening and stuff. So please check them out. Can't say enough good things about them. They're word whizzes. So formattingformula.com or YouTube forward slash C forward slash formatting formula. Tell them the geology flannel cast sent you. 
All right. Oh, we'd all, I'd also like just to take it. Speaking of paying bills, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our Patreons out there. Thank you yeah. for being Patreons. Thank you for supporting us. Uh, there's a, there's a whole slew of people listening to us live right now tonight. who are part of our, uh, uh, what is it? The, uh, Topaz members. Courts. Courts, I'm courts will get you in the door. Courts members. Thank you. Courts will get you in the door. <laughs> Get you to get you to the dance floor. So our quartz members, thank you very much. Uh, we have more than quartz members listening too. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate it. Um, please uh, keep supporting us. So that's that's all. I just want to say thanks to them too. Yeah, right, Formula Informa is great. They 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 really do keep the lights on. Actually, you know, keeping our website up and all that stuff. But the Patreons are, uh, but keep us. I don't know in stickers. I guess. <laughs> Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Um, all right, who wants to? Uh, what? Who wants to jump in with the next story? Um, uh, I got go, one go about go jump new, at once. <laughs> I, I just, uh, I have one about uh, new exotic minerals all right. forged in the furnace of a Russian volcano. Oof. This sounds intimidating. Yeah, it sounds like good writing is what it sounds like. Yes. <laughs> um, so a new study, researchers in Russia report they've discovered uh, a creation that was basically a new mineral that's never been documented before. Um, vibrantly blue-green crystallized substance the team has called petrovite. Um, it was found in a volcanic landscape of Russia's far east atop the Tolba Chink. Chick, Toba Chick, volcano in the Kamchatka Peninsula. Kamchatka. Uh, Kamchatka. Sorry, Kamchatka. Uh, if anyone plays Risk, Kamchatka is one of the uh, territories you can own. Um, so, <laughs> how do you know that? <laughs> did you play uh, Risk you recently? Didn't, you didn't. <laughs> Listen, I did not know it's that. Just, I it's it's in my brain. It's in my brain. So. Uh, so this, you know, this uh, Tolba Chicks uh, volcano has uh, erupted over thousands of years, but in recent times, two notable events, um, the great Tolba Chick fissure eruption of 75 and 76. You guys remember that, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. the second of lesser of the two, uh, 2012 and 2013. So the force of these eruptions, you know, um, tore apart cinder cones, uh, basically the the force and the stuff and the fumaroles and all this stuff actually created um lays claim to 130 type locale minerals 130 well, so from that region. Saying, there's 130 minerals that only come from that area well that's their type locality where, where they're oh they're where type they're locality. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. where they're famously known for um or first or first identified there so um, <clears throat> so the specimens studied here were discovered in 2000, 20 years ago. Okay. Um, and they were associated with this 1975 eruption because the 2012 eruption hadn't happened yet. Um, and it was stored for later analysis for 20 years. <laughs> you know what? Wow. This is like one of Jesse's tabs. You know, I'm, okay. I am, I am going to get to this. I'm just going to put it over here for a little while till I can get to it. Very similar to my lab as well. <laughs> better, better late than never. Yeah, yeah. just uh, for those of you, Jesse was holding up his phone earlier. He has like hundreds of tabs. He has so many his... tabs. It, you know, like on your, on your browser, it tells you, you know, how many tabs are open. His just says the infinity number at this point. Now, that's not a joke. <laughs> It, like legit, joke. it does. He hit, he hit that number where they just stopped counting the the, the tabs. Now it's just I'm gonna get there someday. Right. So yeah, I mean, so I feel like you can uh, empathize with this scientist or this team of scientists. So, um, <clears throat> it is a uh, what is it? A copper sulfate mineral. Okay. But the interesting thing about it is it has seven oxygen atoms, which is a very rare configuration so okay um the coordination is characteristic only of a couple compounds as well as serachinite um which is also a mineral that's found um 
near this Tolbachik, uh volcano. So um, the framework is consistent of oxygen atoms, sodium, sulfur, and copper. <clears throat> it is effectively porous in nature, demonstrating interconnected pathways that can enable sodium ions to migrate through the structure. Hmm. So they're trying to figure out how to use this for um, – um, like electrolytes and stuff, like basically batteries. Like oh yeah, yeah sure, sure. Or something like that. So, um, they they they're you know it's pretty pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. So, but it's funny that it was sitting somewhere for twenty years before someone decided to look at it. <laughs> yeah, like I said, better late than um, happy it got out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, but anyway, really really cool. Uh, it, <clears throat> it is really really difficult in the past. I would say hundred years to identify an actual new mineral. Um, it's one of those like aha moments you have when, I don't know, maybe you're a freshman in college and think like, well, why am I going to study this? They studied it all. <laughs> they, they figured it all out. Like, why would I study geology though? They know where all the rocks are kind of <laughs> thing. Um, this is one of those moments where it's like, Nope, Nope. Uh, you know, well, it's it's very difficult to be just an observable scientist at this point where you can just like pick up something, study it, and you're the first one to do it. Now you have to like get into the nitty gritty and like the atomic structure and the, the how many oxygen atoms are in the lattice and all that jazz. But got to go into a volcano to find a new mineral. I I guess, um, you know, maybe maybe we'll what are, commission a field trip. Now, what are, there's like there's a, a whole bunch of I don't know off the top of my head, but there's a whole bunch of rules out there about naming naming a mineral they can't you can't you're not allowed to name a mineral after yourself i know that and i don't know there's 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 it's not just like you could you could find a mineral and just like oh i'm gonna you know name this so i thought that was yeah i thought that was true for a few things like like uh fossils and things like that but i don't know i could be wrong i i feel like isn't there like isn't there a story, and it might be apocryphal, about wasn't there a guy? I don't think it's with minerals. I think it was like rock formations. But he was always submitting name. He was always trying to name things after himself. Yes. And they kept getting like people were like, "No, you can't <laughs> stop, stop trying to name it after yourself." Yep. J- Joe, you know, Joe Schmoite or whatever. Exactly. So, but <laughs> <clears throat> hubris, I guess. But anyway, so really, really cool that they found this new mineral but it's even cooler the story that it just kind of sat around for 20 years um before they actually identified it and you yeah. know i was just i was i was reading the story about um about uh the hanford washington nuclear plant or like nuclear research facility where they part of the manhattan project and they were talking about naming elements and it was you know in the 30s they um when they, you know, discovered uranium, <clears throat> they named it after the planet uh, Uranus, uh, Uranus, and uh, <clears throat> then when they discovered, so that has what um, ninety-two protons. When they discovered the next one with ninety-three, they were like, "Well, the planet after that is Neptune, so we'll call it Neptunium." And then the next one with ninety-four, they're like, "Well." Antonia? plutonium named after pluto <laughs> they're just the creativity is just like what's what's the next planet we got yeah what are we working with here planet x <laughs> running out yeah. of planets here well what do they do they, they yeah. got rid of pluto so see you later yeah now it's just me but there's a lot more dwarf planets so we can name them after all the other dwarf planets there you go but it, the, there was something in the was it the 60s or 70s where it was like uh berkelium californium yeah, uh, because and, that's probably like with the um, where they they developed the elements. Yeah, Ber- it was at Cal yeah, Berkeley. Some yeah. particle collider or something like that, right out there. But then yeah. they were they were mad that they didn't like make it into like a sentence or or something more clever. And they're like, it is really really difficult to <laughs> discover <laughs> these new elements. We are not guaranteeing that we're gonna because like, they found like two like pretty in pretty quick succession and. You know that 
I guess, I don't know, the president of the university or so, somebody was like, well, why don't you name them like this? And he's like, because we might not be the ones to discover the next one. It might be someone in Russia or, or, or China yeah. or, or something yeah. like that. So, yeah, it's, yeah, Berkelium and then Californium. After that, it's Einsteinium, Fermium, Mendeleevum. Yeah. They're yeah. just, yeah. They're, it's, it's a shame that Mendeleev yeah. didn't get, you know, yeah, one, anything one named one. after him until like. <laughs> one of, yeah, uh, Nobelium, Laurentium, Rutherfordium, uh, Borium. Man, they, they just... Oh, Rankin, 111. Rankinium, Copernicus. Hmm. Anyhow. So anyway, yeah. back to the geology flannel cast. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, hey. I just... Man. Why don't I just keep naming elements I, off the rocks, rocks, all the rocks, rocks and rocks. minerals? Yeah. <laughs> made up of elements but uh they are yeah yeah interesting interesting stuff but spe speaking of the periodic table i did watch that uh movie radioactive about uh mary curie it's on oh. amazon uh it was, it was pretty interesting huh. how she uh discovered radium um she you had to basically break down like 400 t or 40 tons of pitch blend and huh. like dissolve it in acid 40 what's, tons what's and pitch it like, blend yeah it's like a uranium deposit oh okay, okay. Uh, break it break it all down dissolve it in acid like you know it was four thousand tons and it was like oh. four thousand gallons of acid and then yeah yeah it's crazy yeah it's, uh pitch blend is just uranonite yeah that's what oh okay, um, okay um but yeah this the thing i was reading about hamper when they're so they did it at um one of the school, it might've been Berkeley, one of the schools in, in California, when they, um, when they isolated plutonium, yeah, they're just doing like, they, they, they bombarded like uranium in a cyclotron. And then they're just taking like the, the uranium and putting it in acid, trying to like separate it out, just like on a bench top. Jeez. And they, the hood in the room didn't have a fan on it. So sometimes if it was giving off too much gas, they would they would go out. It had a little balcony though. <laughs> they would like just have like the beakers on this balcony to to, <laughs> to oh nice get that's rid great of nice yeah. nice oh yeah. Uh, I actually worked for an engineering firm previously, and uh, they were awarded the job. It was a it was uh, what is the lab down in Tennessee? Uh, Oak, Ridge. Oak Ridge. Uh, they used to wash radioactive parts with acid, and it was in this like concrete lined steel floor, like like really reinforced insulated building. But years and years of washing stuff with acid actually ate a hole in the steel floor, cool. and just all this radioactive material <laughs> was washed down into the ground. Yeah, and they actually. My company actually devised this. Well, my company and several others they devised a system where they would like put in sheer walls, and then like a basically a gantry crane would like come in, so nobody would have to go in the room, and they would just dig it out and like put it on a conveyor belt. Like it was just really cool, like system that was devised so that nobody had to be inside the building ever. Um, it was all automated. It's really, wow. really, really neat. They made a little animation about it and stuff. But yeah, it's it's funny how just stuff was done back then. Like, you know, yeah, we'll just put it on a fume hood. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be oh, fine. fine. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Dilution is the solution to pollution. So well said. Anywho. Yeah. All right. So yeah, that's all I got on new minerals. All right. Um nice. All right. Well, I got I got two stories we can uh, we can jump into. This first one, I think that we could. Uh, you guys will like this one. So the, this article um, that I want to talk about uh, is oh the it says uh, the Swiss Alps continue to rise. Evidence from cosmic rays show uplift outpaces erosion. All right. So wow. this comes into. Uh, you know, we, we've kind of talked about this in the podcast before previously, but, um, you know, when, when, as soon as mountains start to form, right, erosion kicks in, right? Mother nature wants everything to be flat, 
right? She does, she hates topography. She hates the, she hates the mountains. She wants to just flatten the mountains and- As well as the valleys. She hates the valleys too. She hates the valleys, fill yeah. them up. You know, she wants everything just to be flat as a pancake and she's not very exciting in that sense, all right? So there's this, uh, like I said, the study came out and uh, there was a group uh, headed by members from uh, uni the University of Bern, near the Alps, coincidentally, um, so anyways, like I said, they, they came to the conclusion that the parts, parts of, the, of the Swiss Alps are rising faster than they're being eroded. So, okay, so how do we figure this out? Well, so what they did was they looked at the isotope of beryllium-10, all right? And so they took sediment samples from 350 rivers all throughout the, um, the European Alps that are draining off of the Alps and all, all throughout Europe, all right? And they analyzed the beryllium-10 content of the sediment in the rivers. So you might be asking, okay, so what, what the heck is, what's, what's beryllium-10? Why, why, why are these geologists interested in this and how are they figuring out how fast the Alps are eroding based on the beryllium-10 content? Well, first let's, let's jump into how beryllium-10 is formed, all right? Beryllium-10 is formed by the process of cosmic spallation, right? So you get these cosmic rays coming off the sun. You get this, there's all this cosmic junk coming off the sun, and it hits the surface of the Earth. And specifically what happens is uh, in areas where you have the mineral quartz, quartz, the chemical formula for quartz is SiO2, right? So the part that we're going to be talking about is the O2, the two oxygens on, uh, on that chemical formula. All right, so the cosmic rays hit the quartz, and what happens is there's a natural nuclear reaction, all right? This is, this is cosmic spallation, all right? And it turns that oxygen in the quartz, that, that O2 from the SiO2, into beryllium-10. All right, so that's how beryllium-10 is formed. So we look at this, and this, so it forms on the surface of the Earth. So when you... When you, uh, when you analyze the amount of beryllium-10 on the surface, in areas where you see more beryllium-10, that means you have an older surface. You're getting more beryllium-10 forming. In areas where you have less beryllium-10, that means it's a younger surface. So now we can start to see how the sediment is starting to pile up. The sediment that's coming off the Alps, the, as, as Mother Nature is tearing apart the Alps, she's eroding them down, all of that, you're making, basically we're making little rocks out of big rocks. So we have all the sediment now draining off of the mountains and goes into the river systems that are draining off of the Alps, right? And then from the river systems, then it starts to get deposited along the, you know, along floodplains and, and things like that, point bars along the rivers. And so that's what now, the- Chris, uh, do, do they take into account the parent material? Like what if there was hmm. just less quartz coming off of this mountain versus that mountain? I think it's a general average. Um, okay. But that's, I just, you know, that's the first thing that ran through my mind. It's like, well, what if, what if there's just yeah, I, stuff to begin with? Yeah. And you know, there are, there are, that's good. That's a really good question. I don't know. I've never done any beryllium 10 dating before. And it's and this cosmogenic dating. Um, I've never, I never worked with that before. I don't know exactly. Um, I'm sure in, to an extent, you're right. If, if there's just no quartz there, um, it would have to be where I would imagine it would have to be where your source materials coming from right so. that's what i mean yeah yeah so, uh, just something that popped in my head <clears throat> so eddie what I, I, they were able to use it for this study all right um so what they found was trust them. or or i just debunked the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> So what they were able to do was they were able, able to identify the areas of fastest erosion in the Alps. Um, and that's happening in this, uh, uh, in this area of uh, Valeria, of Val, uh, Valais, and uh, especially in, around, it's known as the Ilgraben. And we have erosion rates of about 7,500 millimeters per thousand years. So it's a... A nice, that's a nice chunk of erosion happening there. And the slowest rate- What is that, seven meters? Seven meters, yeah. All right, seven meters over a thousand years. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. Seven meters, yeah, seven and a half that meters a per thousand years. Yeah. 
I mean, uh, you, yeah, I guess, I mean, you're shedding a mountain, though. But so you you're got a sub- lot to work. Yeah. Well, the story, the plot thickens. All right. Just, Ooh. just you wait. Literally? <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that was good. See, that, that was nice. a good one. That was, that was good. <laughs> All right. The areas, uh, so Eastern Switzerland, uh, near an area called Thor, uh, that has the slowest rate of erosion in the Alps of 14 millimeters per thousand years. Whoa. And that's really slow. Yeah. yeah. Has it got yeah. like a protective dome on it or something? Why? It's made of titanium. That's weird. No, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. And so now further, uh, further diving into the study, uh, in the Central Alps, the difference between uplift and erosion it is, is as much as 700 millimeters per thousand. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, 800 millimeters per thousand years. So there's more uplift than erosion happening in the Central Alps. The Western Alps. What? There's the what difference. What did you say that sedimentation rate was? Well, it's not sedimentation rate. Oh, it's it's uplift, tectonic uplift. No, no, before that, the really slow one. Oh, uh, the erosion. Fourteen rate. millimeters. Fourteen millimeters. Fourteen millimeters, millimeters per, thousand. per thousand years. Yeah. Whoa. Which is yeah. essentially that's got to be negative. That's what they. It's got to be. I mean, that's slower than like the sedimentation in the deep ocean, which is slow. And that's what they say in this article. It's just like it's 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 boringly slow. Um, what do they say? It's a uh, yeah. <laughs> they want excitement. They went yeah. out to the Alps for excitement, here, and they got here, none. Quote the uh, let's see. Uh, one of the geologists uh, associated with this study. Um, his last name is uh, Schullinger. I I don't see what his. Um, anyways, uh, he said that the erosion rate is. Um, Almost boring how fa- how slow it is. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Yeah, yeah. So, it takes a lot to bore geologists. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here we go. This. I'm sorry. I was looking for the quote. This. This erosion rate is very low. Almost boring. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. 14 millimeters per thousand years. Yeah, that's that's really slow. Um, all right. So, all right, so the areas where the, uh, the Alps are growing is the central, the central Swiss Alps. Uh, that's the difference. So they have 800 millimeters um, per thousand years of more uplift than erosion. All right. The 800 West- millimeters is like almost a meter, right? Uh, no, yeah. Yeah, it's it's eighty centimeters. So right, so it's almost a meter. Almost a meter. We'll, we'll call it a yard <laughs> for us, <Yeah>. America. Eighty <laughs> percent of the way to a meter. There you go. Okay. Um, so it's moving up about three feet. <laughs> <laughs> I, More than it's being eroded, so it's actually getting bigger three feet per thousand years. I, I just did the math to not of, offend people who get angry at our conversions it's moving up at 2.6 feet per year 2.6 feet sorry yeah <laughs> i'm not even good at per year our, our english units or per thousand per years. per thousand years per, per thousand per year per <laughs> yes. i was like what the <laughs> helps with the tallest mountain yes. on earth yes so all our european listeners people in ireland and whatnot i apologize sorry well, I get, just, do, do, I, yeah anyway what? You don't apologize. You were you were right when you said it was close to meter, 0. 0.8 meters. There you go. So very very cool. <laughs> um, okay, so then the Western Alps, the erosion and uplift are balanced, so they're kind of like in equilibrium. It's not, it's not doing anything. Huh. And then in the Eastern Alps, erosion's greater than uplift. Now, let's let's uh, hear some really interesting stuff. So they, they figured out the erosional rates in, uh, of the Alps. The rates of erosion depend on landscape. And so surprisingly, what they found out in the study is that precipitation and water runoff have no measurable influence on erosion. It's all about slope and relief of the terrain you're dealing with. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. So except, except here's the weird Ah. thing now. Here's the weird thing. And they don't understand why this happens. 
that works. It's so it's, it's all about uh, it's all, all about slope and relief, except for when you have very steep terrain, like uh, areas where you have granitic and limestone, basically cliffs. Um, you have you have all this material that's exposed over large areas, and erosion is slower than expected. You would think that where you have these sheer cliffs, that the erosion would be would be very high, but it's actually much slower than expected. And this was a surprise to the um, the people involved in the study, and and, uh, and they don't know why that that happens. Um, and then finally, the erosion rates in the Alps are linked to the last ice age because the ice carved out the terrain and it created it uh, it created the um, the slope and relief that we see today. Neat, yeah. So, a little story there yeah. about. Uh, a little bit of erosion in the apps. I like it. So, like I said, once as soon as yeah, that, it's, it almost sounds like it's a seesaw. Like you know, some of it's going up, some of it's going down, some of it's staying the same. Well, you know, and it, it's I really <laughs> thought it was interesting. You know, looking at the different erosional rates along the Alps. That's you know so much like when when you we talk about this this balance between uplift and erosion. I think a lot of people just generally think that there's a uniform rate of erosion across the board in, in the Alpine environment. And it turns out it's not, it's, 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 it's variable. So it all depends. Yeah. Huh. It all depends on where there's you're no, at. There's no mother nature buzzsaw. Like, all right, you're at 35,000 feet. Just yeah. I mean, so keep like, shaving you down. So you keep getting bigger. Yeah. So theoretically you could have a mountain range. That's the whole area is being uplifted at the same rate, but you have different rates of erosion cutting down. So it'll appear that, that with the net balance, it'll appear that that parts of that range are growing faster than other parts. And I'd like to see a study over time. If the, removal of the glaciers are making the mountains lighter, which would increase uplift. Make, like isostatic the rebound from the removal. Buoyant. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, sure. Let's get on this. Let's, I, <laughs> let's move to burn. But you know, I, I don't to burn. So pretty much in North America, isn't, I, I, I don't know about, but um, about the Alps or, or Europe, but in North America, the, isn't the isostatic uplift all from the last ice age? It's all done. Like the stuff is, is, is no. pretty much. It's still coming up. Because I know there's there's adjustment. Uh, in, there's in North, yeah, in in Alaska and and, and oh Northern Alaska. Canada. Okay, I'm, sorry. I'm thinking. Okay, I, I mean I'm, I'm even more like, even parts yeah. of the Great Lakes. Even parts of the Great Lakes are starting. The, like the Canadian side is still moving up tiny bit relative to the American side. So you actually are getting like the lakes are almost shifting south ever so slightly, but, but it does happen. Like the isostatic rebound in Canada is still, still happening very, very slowly, but it is still uh, measurable, I guess is the way to put it. So. So I know like, you know, further south they're getting, it's like a seesaw effect and it, they're actually getting subsidence as a result from that. Uh, isostatic uplift further up north. It's 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 fairly complicated process of, of what's going on with that. It's it's not just it's not just kind of cut and dry. You know the glaciers are gone. Everything pops up. Wait, it's not just like taking a bowling ball off of your memory foam mattress the way I teach it. The only way. I teach <laughs> the way I <laughs> not, uh -oh. not I mean, like, don't ruin this. Well, that's why, like, uh, the, in America, like, the Mid-Atlantic states have the second highest rate of sea level, relative sea level rise in the country behind, like, New Orleans. Um, it's because there, there's actually subsidence occurring there that's as a result of the isostatic uplift further up north. It's, a sea, it's like that, that seesaw effect. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. All right. I'm there gonna, you go. I'm the sorry. more you know. <laughs> <laughs> see what i saw i'll buy it i'll buy that for a dollar anybody know where that's from no i buy that for a dollar there you go nice work david robocop uh, <laughs> some right. of detroit's finest <laughs> so i got uh i got one more story here and uh this story talks about 
continents in their infancy, all right? Continents prone to destruction in their infancy, new study finds. Um, so uh, there's a new study that was just published uh, today, actually, in Nature. And, um, and like I said, what, um, so we know that the first one and a half billion years of Earth history is, 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 is not well understood. We don't have any actual crust from the very beginning, this time period that we call the Hadean. All right. Uh, so there was a new back study in, back in the day, back in like OG Earth, you know. So um, there's a new study that came out, and these geologists were using numerical modeling to show, and they're they're showing that the early Earth released internal heat that's like three to four times that of the present day. This was much hotter, like right in the very beginning of the Earth, right? So. This caused melting in the shallow mantle. So the mantle is the, the part of the earth that's just below the crust. Um, so the shallow, the shallow mantle started to melt and then it extruded out as onto the, onto the surface of the earth as lava, right? Uh, so then once that starts happening, you start melting, melting the, uh, the shallow mantle the stuff that's left behind was dehydrated and rigid. And this is what formed the framework of the first continents. So these early continents that did form, the, the very, very first continents that formed when the earth was like, a, was like a baby, they were like really weak and they were prone to destruction for the, from like basically the beginning of the earth, 4.5 um, billion years ago to 4 billion years ago. And basically all that material was just getting recycled. Nothing, nothing's, nothing really is left over. Very, 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 very tiny little bits. Um, if anything, to these, these little zircon crystals, and that's, that's about all that's left over from the very, very beginning. But over time, these early continents progressively start becoming more differentiated, all right, and rigid over, and that lasted about a billion years. And this is how they think the first cratons were formed. So you basically just kind of keep on, keep on melting the stuff and recycling, and then the continents start separating out. That's what differentiation uh, means. So they're progressively melting, they're differentiating, and they're becoming more stable continents. Um, so like I said, this was all happening in the Hadean, and all of that crust was completely recycled, and it really took uh, the development of the upper mantle to form, they, they kind of call like these like rafts, or this like protective shielding underneath the continent in order for it to stop getting basically destroyed and, and, and recycled over and over again. It's kind of like this. So that all that, that, that rigid stuff in the upper mantle protected the, the early continents. And then once that started happening, boom, everything flipped around. And now we started getting the continents, you know, hanging out and being preserved. So new- uh, I like it, Co continental new life rafts. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's the name of our new band continental <laughs> life rafts um yeah so I, was, I thought that was a, a neat little study about you know trying to figure out what happened early in the earth's history because we can't there's no outcrops from the rocks way 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 back in the day um showing this stuff so yeah it's a real real pain in the butt trying to get get the early stuff yeah. 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 Can't find it along the side of the highway. No, no. And if you do, retire, write that in there because it's <laughs> you'll never find that ever again. Um yeah. Yeah. I do have a two two billion year old rock. Wow, that's pretty old. Somewhere. Where's that from? Yeah. Somewhere out west. Somewhere the west. Great crazy. unconformity. Yeah. Um yeah, I forget exactly where, but um, it was a great unconformity. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> I remember thinking, like, this is billions of years old. I'm going to take this home. And it's just like a piece of, like, pink granite. It's nothing, yeah, <laughs> nothing yeah. extraordinary. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, comes with a cool story, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> great unconformity. I would imagine it's on the bottom a, side of the, the great unconformity. 
Uh, maybe it was overturned. You don't know. Uh, uh, no, it was on the bottom. Um, but yeah, it was a hot summer day, June 2007. You remember it like it was down yesterday. On the side of the road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Changing a tire. Are you uh, serious? No, 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 no none of this happened. <laughs> <laughs> Use this rock to like prop up the jack and get the car up. It saved you. Exactly. Uh, no, uh, this woman had her car on the side of the road. It started rolling down the hill, and I took this two billion old rock and I threw it and it put the car into gear. And the car stopped rolling down the hill, and her baby was saved in the back seat. Ah, oh, you're you're a hero. Yeah. I is am. he or is the rock the real hero? That's true. In in rock we trust. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. Um all right, you guys any other stories? So, yeah. or is that... uh, do we have time for one? I've got one, but I can hold off too. No, we got time for like one more. Yeah. All right. So pretty cool story out of Hawaii, uh, if you're familiar. It's, a state in the ocean. Um, very, that's a how very I good describe it. <laughs> Not to be confused with the ocean state, which is Rhode Island, but continue. Yes, no, no. This is this is the only one of our states totally in the ocean. Um, so Hawaii has this issue, right, where <clears throat> they they get a lot of rain. Parts of the islands are literally rainforest, but the rain doesn't really hang out on the surface. Um, it, it either runs off in rivers or it, it, it um, infiltrates. And so the, there's, you know, there's a pretty high demand for water on the island between just residential use or agricultural use. And so <clears throat> part of the issue is, is that there are some reservoirs, but the reservoirs are at, at, at higher elevation. Um, and and when you pull the water out, it actually it has a, a a pretty immediate impact on surrounding ecosystems because the water is sort of percolating down down slope. Um, so there there is this issue about water use on on, on the islands, uh, especially. So this is the big island here. <coughs> um, so, so there's there's this real concern about about water use and, and, and trying to balance what they're withdrawing. Um, so, people have been sort of looking into this, and one of the things they sort of recognized is that by using sort of isotopes in the water, they can track what what's in these aquifers, and they they recognize that sort of the the water coming from the rainfall versus what they're seeing in the in the aquifers there's missing water uh -oh. it's, it's not sort of working out and so it was always just assumed that it was just sort of seeping out at the it was just sort of moving laterally across the island and, and then just kind of seeping out at the coastline where, where it meets the ocean uh but recently um doing uh there's some researchers doing some geophysical work <clears throat> sort of thought about this and in hawaii and they describe it here in the study hawaii is is like a an iceberg right in that only the the small part is sort of peaking above the ocean line and and you know most of it's underwater and so that the, their thought was well maybe there's just lower aquifers at, at depth and that's where this missing water is is going and and here what they found is that that's sort of the case but the aquifers themselves are actually offshore because that's you know the, the island sort of spreads oh, out yeah, as you yeah. go underwater and <clears throat> they're they they don't so the, it's all volcanic rock so it's really porous and so you know it was kind of assumed that yeah that some of that aquifer water probably percolated to depth, but if it's below the water line, then it's mixing with the, the salt water and then it's no good. But here, using some of this, 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 geo, this geophysics, 
they notice that there's actually this, this layer of uh, volcanic ash that, that's been compacted in some of these layers of rocks that acts as an impermeable barrier. Ooh. An aquatard. And so an aquatard. Uh, it would it would be an aquaclude actually because it's it's not letting any in. <clears throat> mm, okay. So, um, uh, and and one of the ways because when you're doing this this geophysical survey, they're doing, I guess I don't you would know better than I, resistivity I guess, because the salt water conducts electricity mm -hmm. but fresh water doesn't. Mm -hmm. and so that's basically how they, they piece together that there's these big lenses of salt water that go like two miles offshore. Fresh water, you mean? Fresh water, yeah. <laughs> sorry. That go that are that are found um, that that wow. go pretty pretty far out into the ocean. And um, so there's some thought now that they could they could basically access this water almost like a offshore oil rig, but for water. Huh. It'd be pressurized because it's being pushed down from above and it's. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, okay. And. Um, Artesian. Yeah, so it, it's sort of interesting here. Um, they, they may have found a, sort of a, a solution to, to some of their water woes. There's some, some concern that this still might affect some of these fragile ecosystems. Because you know, a rainforest environment, the ecosystem is really sort of hanging on the edge. Yeah, fra <laughs> fragile. Um, but there is thought that there's applicability on other sort of hotspot volcanic islands elsewhere in the in the Pacific. You know, Fiji and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah. The yeah. So that's oh. So Patreon Vince here. Uh, first time on, on the show, long time listener, big fan of the podcast here. Uh, he, he spent some time on Hawaii last year doing some work and he, he just said one of the reasons some of the new telescopes got, got nixed on the big island is, is they're worried about contamination of the main reservoir on Mauna Kea. So, <clears throat> you know, that, and that shows where they're, these reservoirs are at. You know, Mauna Kea is 14,000 feet. Not, not that the reservoir is at 14,000 feet, but it's at elevation. What's that in millimeters? Several thousand, several, several thousand millimeters. Next. <laughs> so, several thousand. So I just thought that was sort of interesting. Um, just, uh, yeah, man. You, know, you don't think about water issues, maybe you, you kind of picture this lush, verdant island and it rains often, and you don't maybe think of that water is to some extent scarce. Uh, 14,000 feet is um, 4.2 million uh, millimeters. There you go. Now I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's my story. Cool, man. That's, 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 that's I've wild. never heard of that. Yeah, freshwater lenses underneath the ocean. Yeah, now watch, watch what's going to happen is they're going to they're gonna drill into it and it's going to cause like the island to collapse or something. Yeah. I just uh, imagine that this, so if somebody screws it up, then you just have all the fresh water just dumping out into the ocean. Mm. Yeah. The salt water intrudes into it and then it's all ruined. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if that would happen. If the fresh water is being pushed out, you think salt water could still get in there? If it's under pressure, uh, I mean, fresh water is more buoyant, so it's going to want to go up. Oh. What if you got back pressure and the, the mountain erupted, but with water? Oh. I, oh. What if, what if, no, it's, so you drill down right through the ocean floor and you hit that freshwater lens what, and you leave the hull open, would it still stay pressurized? Because you have the weight of the ocean water pushing down. Uh, yes. No, it would it would not stay pressurized because you have more weight. You have more weight above. Okay, that's actually okay, yeah, sticking yeah. up. Oh, that Darcy's law. Oh. <laughs> yep, they get you every time. Every time, every time. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever use a, a hose level? I did. I have. I, I have used one of those. My buddy was uh, building a house, and I helped him with the uh, the foundation. 
Yeah. So for those of you listening, you actually fill a clear hose full of water and you can like measure level like around corners and things like that. And maybe from inside the house to outside the house, you kind of draw a line on it and you can, the, the water is always going to find level. So you can figure out like, okay, I'm at my line. Like, where are you? And then you draw a line there and then there you go. You know, your level from wherever the one side of the hose is all the way to the other side of the hose. So that's been used for thousands of years, that technique. Nope. I just came up with it. Steve just came <laughs> up with it. I stand corrected. <laughs> yeah. A laser level. Yes, David, I've heard of a laser level, but laser levels can't go through walls but you can oh. run a hose through a window and outside and around a corner. So, <laughs> which I've had to do. And, and I, you're, you're, you're like going old school. You're, you're doing yeah. the work the ancients did. Yeah. Yeah. It's not because I can't afford a laser level. <laughs> no, it's true. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for respecting my Amishness. Uh, yeah. So very, very cool. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I want to see what they're going to do with this. You know, yeah. are they going to try to get some water out or at least test it to see, you know, if they pull a little bit of water out, is it going to damage the ecosystem or, um, or take some water out of it and see isotopically, you can figure out how old the water is too. You know, has that water been down there forever or is that water constantly being replenished or, you know, things like that so be interesting wonder, to find out hmm. yeah yeah wonder how far out it goes goes down then far out all right <laughs> two and a half miles is what they found so but two, that's two and a half miles like laterally offshore right yeah how far <clears throat> yeah uh you know it's a pretty shallow slope so yeah it's not quite one to one so Two and a half miles out is probably not, it's less than two miles deep. No, I, I, I just was even, wondering. Even that. that how far out? It, I mean, going out two and a half miles, that's, yeah. I wonder if it extends even far. That's yeah. just like the limit of where they stopped looking for it or if it just keeps on going out further. Or maybe that's just the limit of the geophysics that they yeah, had yeah. available. Yeah. yeah. Um, but to get an uh, oil rig all the way out to Hawaii to drill for water, that's that's an ex, that's expensive water <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean i guess may, maybe they could they maybe they could directional drill from on land huh. but um anyway either either way it, it ain't cheap so no it's not gonna be easy to get to that thing no but you know science baby Let's do it science science um all right that's all i have uh, i think that, i'd that's... like to thank our patreons once again our sponsor the formatting formula formattingformula.com youtube forward slash c forward slash formatting formula i'd like to thank uh all of us for wearing our uniforms today yeah we all had fly we all actually first... wore co collared shirts it's the first time in a in a while we've all been uh sporting the flannel yeah, I'm not gonna lie. It feels weird having a collar on my neck. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's it's winter now, so it is. Well, winter not, is not come. technically, but it's been colder yeah, down. Some... It's been colder in Atlanta than it has been for you guys. We got we we're getting snow uh, two days ago. I was gonna say it's it snowed yeah. here this morning. Uh, yeah, we got some flurries. Today. Yeah, we got some flurries. I was I was surprised. Uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been the nights have been colder down here in Atlanta than up there in philly yeah uh shannon friend of the podcast who was on earlier i, I remember she was living in georgia and they had like two inches of snow and like oh, the was... whole state shut down <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like, there's... they had to import snow plows from like <laughs> there are no snow plows. i forget where like yeah. maryland or something like that snow like, they had no idea what to do yeah <laughs> people yeah. don't know how to drive people don't know how to like yeah crazy crazy so uh yeah be careful out there be careful always be careful um yeah hey, I'll, I'll send you guys a picture of uh snowmageddon from 2014 mm. um but yeah so thanks for listening to the uh 
to the flannel cast. Uh, thanks. I once again, thanks to our, our Patreon friends out there, um, sponsors of the podcast. Uh, if you would like to help out the podcast, if you like what you hear and you're, you're a, a fan of the podcast, you can, um, one of the ways you could help out is uh, you could go to patreon.com and uh, sponsor us a uh, monthly, a uh, monthly sponsorship of the podcast. Uh, we have several different tiers. Uh, the l- lowest starting at $2 a month, less than a cup of coffee a month. Um, and, and all that helps. We're trying to upgrade some equipment here. We got some, got some big dreams, got some big visions here with the, with the, with the flannel cast. Um, every, every dollar helps. So we, we appreciate. Yeah. We're going to fly. We're going to fly to burn and start <laughs> measuring sediment in Switzerland. We're going to look at those erosional Let's rates in the Alps. Or, yeah. just, but I, I can't, I, <laughs> I can't believe we we've gone this far. We have merchandise on our website now. We have not pitched this. Oh yeah. So those of you who are still listening, which is probably zero people, but uh, <clears throat> we actually are starting to sell merchandise on our website. And don't get too excited. It right now it's just stickers. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we're getting there. We're trying. Uh, so for three bucks, you get what five stickers, right? Five so, stickers, yeah. yeah. Yeah, come on, you can't beat that. So if if you can't help us out maybe on a monthly basis for uh, Patreon, maybe you could just help us out for a one-time gift. Think yeah. about it. You can turn anything you want into a geology flannel cast something. Like, see this, this chair over here? Bam. Put a geology flannel cast sticker on it. You got a geology flannel cast chair. You can give that away for Christmas. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the number one ticket item out there. It's like the Tickle Me Elmo doll of the late 90s. Thank, thank you, Steve, for explaining to our fans how stickers work. I'm sure they, they're they very appreciative <laughs> of that. I'm telling you. You, know, um, you, have, you have an old glass, slap a sticker on it, bam. Oh, uh, you that with your ring. I thought that glass was going to shatter, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Yeah, so, anyway, so, yeah, we got stickers up there right now. And a little spoiler alert, uh, something, something else is coming very soon on the uh, on the merch section of the website so stay tuned to that yeah um very cool uh, so i yeah I, i'm sorry we slacked on that one we'll hit it I, hard next I, week i forgot i forgot about that to be honest with you. Yeah. i said <laughs> it and your eyes lit up i'm like am i wrong do we not like, no no yeah we got yeah it's up there yeah. it's up there it's well and i got i I, the I did make a purpose it, it went through um i'm you know can't wait to find my stickers in the mail, nice. Chris. <laughs> They're on their way. The Pony yeah. Express taking them right to. Anyway, it was okay. very, very cool. It gives you like a little invoice number. It was purchase number zero 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 one. <laughs> he was very happy about it. Um, I was. I'm, I'm very excited. So, so, yes. so check that, it out. That's another way. We'll have uh, some more merch coming in the in the very near future. And, um, our, you could, uh, just subscribe to us. You know, we, um, we're out, uh, check us out. We, we post our vi- these vi- podcasts up on YouTube every week. Um, s- subscribe to us from there. Uh, if you don't have, you know, you're not in a situation where you don't want to, you want to just help us out in a very cheap way if that works. Just tell a friend too. tell a friend, um, check out geology. Ge- ah, what is the website? Geology flannel cast.com. All the news stories we talk about every <laughs> It's good. I almost forgot our website. All the news stories we talk about every week are posted up on there. If you want to go look into it even more, read the articles yourself, look up the papers and stuff like that. Um, you can find all those links under the episode of uh, Geology Flannel Cast. Um, yeah, and it, it's December. So December is tell a family member December. <laughs> very good. Tell, tell, <laughs> yes. Tell, tell anybody. Tell a family everybody. member December. Come on. Great. That's I just great. came up with that. I love it. I love it. It's the <laughs> holiday season, you know. When you get, yep. to get your holiday, just tell them how much you love the geology flannel cast. Um, what else? Twitter, uh, at geo flannel cast on Twitter and on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash geology flannel cast. And Woo. that's it. Um, All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again for everyone listening and have a great week. Stay safe. We love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye.